thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction, Andre. And uh, let me begin where one should, which is the beginning, by thanking uh, the wonderful team um, of organizers, uh, Andre, Iris, and Lorenzo. And of course, to, to extend my sincere gratitude to all the colleagues here present, uh, distinguished professors, and first and foremost for our students for joining um, this ninth session and all from outside Eulos that are also attending here this morning. Um, I will be uh, discussing uh, or trying to raise a discussion surrounding one key aspect of the BBNJ uh, uh, treaty, which deals specifically with MPAs but trying to draw uh, a wider picture on some of the issues that are still very much unresolved in the treaty and where one tries to see um, some gray areas in terms of legal interpretation. Just to highlight with one example, with the last question that was raised, this is a very clear cut of legal regimes both within and beyond national jurisdiction, but Unfortunately, or fortunately, one of the main characteristics of the marine environment is its interconnectivity. So we might have very strict legal regimes that very puts everything neatly into boxes within and beyond, but the marine environment really couldn't care less about those uh, legal boundaries, uh, political boundaries, and therefore we need to find tools that somehow make sure that we achieve the ultimate objectives. Because if not, we'll end up with wonderfully drafted texts, which, by the way, is not the case of the BBNJ Treaty. But um, we would see that some of these articles, when then interpreted and applied, would become very difficult uh, indeed. And therefore, the issues of future proofing are very important. But I would raise that the most important thing about a, a, tr a treaty text is actually that it serves its purpose. If not, it's, uh, um, it's, it's only words on paper. So on that very positive <laughs> outlook, uh, I would like to discuss with you some of the, the issues uh, that have already been discussed. And thankfully to Andre and to Iris, they have magnificently presented some of the slides that I had the, uh, included here, because I was not so sure if there would be overlap in our presentations, and therefore benefiting of their uh, uh, presentations. And um, the slides are here, so you don't think that I'm cutting my work. Uh, but the, um, uh, I will just uh, refer to their presentations and try to focus on the uh, topic that I was assigned. Um, I will start by MPAs and the law of the sea, very general uh, considerations, and then move on to the High Seas Treaty and uh, try to draw some conclusions and possibly uh, issues that you might w yourselves want to discuss in the Q&A uh, session. Um, MPAs and the law of the sea. Most of us think of MPAs in a very uh, utilitarian way. Uh, MPAs are very much, to many that work in the field of law of the sea, sometimes they are seen as an end point rather than a starting point. We create an MPA and then it's done, we can go home, everything is done and solved. It's completely the opposite. And an MPA is, once you've classified a marine area as an MPA, because an MPA is precisely that, is giving a status of protection to a specific maritime area due to its ecological, uh, 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 to its different levels of protection that it requires, or dealing with more aggressive or less aggressive usages and activities, so on and so forth, then we give it a status of protection. But that legal status of protection in itself does not solve the problem. It's not as selling and buying a property. Now it belongs to me, now it belongs to you. Classifying a maritime area gives this sense of, this legal uh, sense of protection, but then we need to manage it. We need to monitor it, we need to review it. And most MPAs in the world, I'm sure you are aware of this, if not, you, you probably will be shocked to know, that most MPAs in the world exist on paper only. Meaning that we did create so lawyers have been very successful. We did create a legal status of protection, but then we failed to really create a, a, a regime of monitoring, reviewing, and managing, making the hard decisions after the marine protected area has been classified. And fundamentally, what is wrong about this model is that once you've created an MPA, it exists as such, 
as an MPA, but then because we are lacking all the subst substantive information on the management of that MPA, we do not take uh, lessons from that management and we replicate all these errors all the time and this in essence is one of the biggest problems or challenges of protection and preservation of the marine environment and I have to open a footnote to explain how did we arrive at this status quo uh, as Andre mentioned Stockholm uh, is in all of us that dealing with maritime environmental law is a key point Stockholm is the beginning of uh, uh, the development of international marine environmental law as such. And this development from soft law to hard law. So essentially, marine, international marine environmental law is bits and pieces that were put together and does not exist in a overarching international legal instrument as we have with UNCLOS. Somehow, the international community never thought it was relevant to have one overarching international legal instrument that deals codifies that system in a systematic way with the marine environment. And that is part of the problem. It will not be a solution, but it is part of the problem inevitably. So this means that over the years, everybody wanted to be a good environmentalist from a legal perspective, and we see a plethora of legal regimes addressing marine protection in the marine environment, and different organizations Almost every organization under the sun that has a foot in water has a sort of uh, uh, environmentalist agenda, which can translate into the development and applicability of certain measures of protection of the marine environment. So for example, if you look at the, mar at the marine environment to the maritime space, if you, if you know that famous image of Earth when we remove the water and we only see Earth, let's do the opposite. Let's take out the water, the Earth and just leave the water and look at the blue planet. That blue planet is like a millefeuille or an onion of many layers of legal instruments. Those layers are not connected to each other, in essence. So if you look at regional, let's start with the, the easier uh, example, the uh, regional seas program, and you look at the legal regime established by each one of these, they do not coincide in rules, for example, from, from a rules perspective, they do not coincide necessarily. Then you take, in the same region, you take sectoral approach to fishing, for example, not necessarily working together alongside with environmental protection, but please pay attention to, to the fact that one of the measures where an MPA might be relevant is precisely limiting the activity of fishing. So that, in its essence, would require some uh, dialogue, normative dialogue. And in addition to this, we would have many other different regional approaches. If we look, for example, at the European Union and bring it to the focus of ULOs, you have two fundamental instruments, the Habitats and Birds Directives. They constitute the backbone of environmental protection. Environmental protection. It took a long time for the Natura 2000 network to be extended to the marine environment. And ultimately, this meant that most member states of the EU, when transposing these directives to develop their own environmental law, have little reference or no reference at all to the protection of areas within the marine environment. To illustrate the case of Portugal, in the, one of the main backbones of that legislation, there's only one article referring to marine parks. So, and, and that is what the EU has brought to the table in the last three decades. Of course, there's much more, but this is essentially the backbone of uh, the NPA regimes under the Natura 2000 network. And this brings a lot of complexities in the case of the European Union because there are also regional seas within the European Union and then there is the role of the European Union outside regional seas that are not bordering the European Union, which is the case of Kemlar. And you have substantive jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice addressing some of these issues. So as you can see, the, the picture, and I'm putting it in very broad strokes, is quite complex. Um, the other thing that the, we have managed to create is institutions. And nobody likes uh, institutions or to be institutionalized, or, but we lawyers li love institutions and love organizations because everybody essentially would like to work for these amazing institutions, would like to have jobs there, hopefully in sunny places, but uh, not necessarily effective uh, at such. 
So in addition to creating so many legal regimes at regional, sub-regional, and multilateral level, we've created institutions with, and please uh, note, with non-complementing mandates or roles. So then we have this problem of chairs. Not only we are lacking legal rules that communicate with each other in, in the protection of the, of the marine environment, but we also have created institutions that are pulling in different ways. And that creates a, a big problem, uh, um, as I tr try to illustrate. So for example, in the case of uh, MPAs, I just mentioned they are one uh, area-based management tool, which is, in essence, creates a legal status of protection, but they're not the only one. We have many area-based management tools, and within MPAs, not everything under the sun is an MPA. I'm thinking of, of other uh, forms of protection that do not necessarily constitute an MPA. In addition to MPAs, we have other, not tools, but legal frameworks that are extremely important, and they are completely outside of the picture in the BBNJ agreement, which are which is marine special planning, which would be very important in, as a framework to guarantee that there would be some coordination measures uh, in force. So this is how we managed to arrive in 2023, and now we have the High Seas Treaty. Uh, and until 2023, we had, under different legal regimes, different definitions. And you have to remember, and another bracket, and knowing that there are very reputable uh, internationally reputable professors of international law in the room, and Professor Carboni would, of course, excuse me if I do uh, say anything that is completely outside of the realm of classic international law, but if you look at international law, and it exists today, it's very much the outcome or a strong influence of the common law. If you look at international adjudication, it is common law per se, the idea of precedent, completely contrary to, uh, uh, Ro to Roman or uh, continental law. The reason being because as French has lost its influence, as uh, more and more Anglo-Saxons gain influence in international law, the way we see international law is very contrary to our own tradition, our meaning those that are speaking here today. Craig, don't, don't, uh, don't take it personally, but uh, uh, this, is the, this is the reality. So th in developing international law, we tend to see this from this, this, this vision of international law different to what we have. So if you look at legislation produced in continental uh, Europe, it is, it's not, we do not legislate using abundantly definitions. This is something that we do not do. Contrary to Anglo-Saxon culture, definitions actually is quite strong. So, the, one of the things that the BNJ Treaty does is add another definition of what is an MPA. I myself have always thought that probably this will not be useful to uh, uh, anchor concepts in very stringent definitions that might not be flexible enough to accommodate new realities. Because we already had a definition of MPA, for example, under the CBD, again, within national jurisdiction, OSPAR, Regional Protection uh, 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 of, the, of the Northeast Atlantic. FAO has its own protection areas for the purpose of fishing. And now we have the concept of MPA for BBNJ. And of course, this in itself is useful for the overall, for those of us that are looking through the, 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 the BBNJ treaty. But we have to think wider. We have to think that all these instruments have to work together. And if you look at UNCLOS, for example, there was the good sense of not depositing uh, UNCLOS with a lot of definitions. And you see many references to in UNCLOS that are not simply not defined. Uh, still, we have a definition of MPA for the purpose of this agreement. Um, the other problem is we do not see coordination measures. If yesterday at dinner, we were discussing that the, the first COP of this treaty will be a never-ending COP because it has such a large to-do list to go through that I don't think that it will be successful. One of the things that we will have difficulty, so if anybody invites you to attend the first COP, you know it's a trick, <laughs> so don't go. But the, the, um, the, it will be very difficult to come up with many of the issues that have to be de uh, dealt with. Um, also, one of the biggest challenges we have is 
dealing with areas beyond national jurisdiction, and one fundamental concept of international law, that is the opposability of these rules in areas within, sorry, beyond national jurisdiction for states that do not adhere to these rules. Meaning, how can we oppose an MPA beyond national jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis the rights of states in areas beyond national jurisdiction? Uh, Iris uh, had a list here, uh, I believe it was Andrea, I can't recall, of freedom of navigation, freedom of fishing. If I create under the BBNJ agreement an MPA beyond national jurisdiction, and it has as a measure limiting or uh, prohibiting fishing, how can I then oppose this to a state not party to the BBNJ treaty that wants to fish in the same area under the freedom of fishing? So we have this difficulty. And then Article 7, which is, I believe, one of the most difficult articles in the, in the agreement, how we would really interpret Article 7 that has a shopping list of principles and things that are not principles and are contradictory between each other. How, we, how will the international judge or arbitrator look at this article and know exactly which principles should prevail? Because these principles will not be able to prevail altogether. That, it, that would be a wishful thinking, but it's not, it's not possible. Um, so let's look at some of the track record of MPAs. It is, as, as, uh, as Iris mentioned, the MPAs beyond, uh, beyond national jurisdiction is not something completely uh, new. We have had uh, uh, cases in the past. The first one uh, with beyond national jurisdiction was uh, under Kamlar, and then the second one further out under Kamlar, profoundly criticized, by the way, because all of these MPAs with, in, in, the, in the Southern Ocean, of course, were created initially very ambitious, but then they will be narrowing down because of the interests of fishing and others, uh, and other interests that have, were also in place. Um, and you also have in the extended continental shelf, the first MPA in the extended continental shelf, so in interaction with the high seas, was created by Portugal within OSPAR, and that's the Seamount Rainbow. Um, of course, we also have not only bad news, we have a good example how we may solve some of these problems of uh, communication between different regimes and different institutions. And for example, OSPAR and NEAF, which is the Northeast Atlantic Fishing Commission, have a collective arrangement precisely to make sure that they can speak to together and can articulate. But again, focusing very much on the issues that they want to implement. So that, in a nutshell, brings you, gives you a picture of how MPAs and the law of the sea are being articulated. And I will try to summarize in my concluding remarks some of these considerations. But I would like to move on to the BBNJ Treaty. The background has already been given, as I mentioned. And um, I would only mention one thing that I believe that my, my esteemed colleagues refer to, but I would like to emphasize. One of the biggest problems we have with the BBNJ Treaty is not only having a substantive uh, participation of states, not only signing, ratifying, but then implementing. And once states have signed and ratified, they, on this, in the specific case of this treaty, because of things that Iris mentioned, a lot of states will have to develop newly uh, uh, developed legislation or amend existing domestic legislation particularly in areas of intellectual property rights, in areas of MGRs, in areas of environmental impact assessments, and so on and so forth. In addition to this, several international organizations, and I would mention the International Seabed Authority, uh, will also have to change some of the regulations to accommodate to the standards that we are trying to set up in this agreement. I'll just mention one, environmental impact assessments, which I believe uh, uh, you will refer to, and so I leave it to you, that hot potato. Uh, but that is one of the most difficult things I, I believe we will have to deal with. Everything else has been mentioned, so for the sake of brevity, I will try to move on. Uh, also, this long history, I myself started following this process in, 20, in 2013, and uh, I have to say that um, I believe all of us that were involved with it at the very beginning, middle, or later period, we shall not forget this experience, either for good or for bad, for sure. Particularly those that were there at the last, very last, further resumed session, those of them, I believe, will not go back to New York as that soon, I think. Um, all of this has been mentioned. I will not go into detail. I will just focus on the package deal and the fact that 
the topic that I'm dealing with uh, as the subsequent topic of uh, subsequent topics are all part of the package deal. So the definition of MPA in the in the agreement, and I please pay attention that these articles that I reference here are not necessarily the same ones. Uh, and please make sure that you update the ones based on the text that was approved on June 19th last. The definition is, and I'm reading, geographical defined marine area that is designated and managed to achieve specific long-term biodiversity conservation objectives and may allow, where appropriate, sustainable use provided it is consistent with the conservation objectives. These conservation objectives in itself uh, and the objectives of BBNJ Treaty are identified, but in essence, it's a very uh, unsavory definition, to say the least. But it gives you some uh, inclination of what we try to do, but always remember that a text is always a traumatized child. It had parents that fought about the text. It had a lot of issues that were raised, long hours, and it's a human process, and, it f and therefore the end result is not the one that we would like theoretically, but is the one that states were able to accept and live with, and therefore that's why the text reads as it does. But there are two fundamental objectives that matter. To conserve and sustainable use areas that require protection, that is the main purpose, and to develop a comprehensive system of ABMTs and ecological representative and MPA networks. So again, it does not elaborate specific rules that will ensure these objectives. It set out a, 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 a roadmap to it ultimately achieve them, but inevitably, puts everything on implementation. If you look at the most robust uh, national legal uh, frameworks applicable to MPAs, you see that this is not the case. This is not the case. The, it is much stronger, m more enhanced, uh, the, the measures for coordination and cooperation, and ultimately the decision-making process is far more uh, defined and far more uh, um, um, precise, and therefore, when implementing the, this into national law, it might become a, a, a bit problematic because we will have an international legal framework that is the one that we managed to agree upon, but then at national level, measures have to be made. For example, a state that will ultimately adhere and, and uh, meaningfully want to implement this regime on MPAs will have to take into consideration its own exercise of freedoms of the high seas, for example. And that, of course, requires legislation to be enforced, for example, as that state, as a flag state, for example. Um, there is, an, uh, and I, I, I very much enjoyed Iris' uh, slide where you had this thick text of the procedure for a re requirement. This is something that also happens with the MPAs. There is that idea, and whether that is a good or a bad uh, decision, only time will tell. But there is also this very much robust uh, decision-making process. What I feel that there is some, uh, we will see the same thing happening here in all the decision-making process as we, w as we see today, for example, with the CLCS, with the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. We have procedures, we have rules, but then once the, 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 all the process comes starting in, we will see there are not enough hands to deal with all of this, despite stringent deadlines. And therefore, I think that this might become a bit more complicated. For example, on the developing preliminary reviews proposals, consultations and assessments, whether that is uh, feasible within the time frames that we have. But of course, the COP will ultimately make these decisions, including uh, MPAs. And the idea of consensus is a good one from a diplomatic point of view, but might be uh, the, the difficult. And therefore, there is this idea that we can do this with three-fourths and two-thirds majority as well. And of course, there are emergency measures, implementation and monitoring and review. These emergency measures from my reading of the text and understanding of these matters, but I believe they might be a bit complicated and might lead to some interesting decisions um, down the line. Uh, the institutional framework has to be created and developed, of course, and don't forget the important thing. This organization will not work without the financial resources available. So that is the most complex thing we have to do, which is make sure that the funding is there to, um, to, to develop. 
So some ideas, I just highlighted some of the difficulties in the interaction with existing frameworks, both within and beyond national jurisdiction. As I mentioned, there are maritime areas that extend, that exist within and beyond national jurisdiction, because the ecosystem in, uh, itself requires that uh, approach. Of course, if we look at NPAs and is, its reference in Article 7, the fundamental principle is an ecosystem approach. And the ecosystem approach, which is a fundamental uh, aspect of uh, the protection of the marine environment, is very much, it is listed in, the, in that big shopping list of, of principles and rules. Again, not everything that's under that uh, article is a legal pr rule or principle, but the ecosystem approach is a very important one, but is very much neglected in terms of hard law to implement the ecosystem approach. Because if that was in place, this distinction within and beyond national jurisdiction would never prevail. So what we have is a prevalence of an existing model of ocean governance based on areas within and beyond, and rules applicable to both within, to within and rules applicable to beyond. And then we have something that is more of an objective than a principle, that is the ecosystem approach, where we continue to fail. We continue to not develop rules that secure an ecosystem approach, meaning the ecosystem is first rather than the interests of states that are relevant, let's say a coastal state or uh, uh, other states. And um, this brings me to the fundamental problem of the rules of not to undermine or without prejudice. These, of course, uh, are the only way out when things get slightly stuck. It's not, it would not be possible to identify all the situations where rules had to be articulated because there are too many rules, of course, and different mandates. So the text sends us into this very large uh, dimension, which is the dimension of not to undermine and without prejudice. And to ensure that we maintain the, we ensure that we do not infringe upon the mandates and rule and roles of other organizations or the rights of other states, we have this very broad. But then this has to work. This has to narrow down. What do we consider not to undermine? To what extent can we consider that we're not undermining? And what is without prejudice? And I'm sure many of you in the room will say, well, surely international jurisprudence has given us plenty of uh, tips how to we, what, what would be the relevant test to make sure that we do not undermine and we do not prejudice the rights of other states. But as recent jurisprudence shows, international courts and tribunals are becoming more creative than ever before. And if we look at something that was settled under international law, what is, what is customer international law? If you look at the recent decision of Nicaragua, Colombia, we see the opening of Pandora's box. And that is a new approach to customer international law. And what has some scholars have now referenced in a, a discussion that will take place in the next few days, now the International Court of Justice introduced us to a new reality. Uh, secretive customary international law. That customary international law that existed in secret, and lo and behold, a court brings it out under the sun, and now we have to deal with this. So this is also one of the problems I see we might have with not to undermine and without prejudice as well in the future. Um, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll come to my uh, concluding remarks. Uh, one thing that I th think is extremely relevant is this concept or the notion of the interests of indigenous peoples and local communities and traditional knowledge to identify areas of need of protection. This, to many of us that are not familiar with the law of the sea or are not familiar with constitutional law outside Europe, in Anglo-Saxon countries, specifically those with indigenous uh, uh, groups, think, might think that this is something exotic in this text. Well, that is something that we should get rid of very, uh, 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 very rapidly. If you look at constitutional law in countries such as Canada, for example, the rights of indigenous peoples, peoples have always been protected, not only protected as a minority, but also as part of a decision-making process, both politically and legally. And that this text and the BBNJ Treaty emancipates international law also to that realm. And that is extremely important, particularly also in the case of the classification of NPAs. And we might use traditional knowledge uh, to make sure that we have a more robust level of protection of specific maritime uh, areas. 
Of course, all of this will depend on the level of signature in September, with which I'm not worried, but then ratification and most importantly, implementation. And of course, as I'm sure all of you know, we, I'm eager to see which countries will make declarations upon signature and ratification and what some of these countries' content of declarations will be, particularly considering those that exist already under UNCLOS. So, conclusions uh, on my presentation. First of all, regardless of what you might think, I'm not a skeptic regarding the BNJ Treaty. I really believe it is an historical moment for which many of us have fought for for many, many years, and there it is quite the outcome of a unique multilateral, multilateral negotiation process. Unique in the sense that for the first time we have delegations that were organized in regional groups, that's not a novelty, but allow them to pull resources. Many of, many of you are probably are not familiar with, but many countries uh, do not have the human resources or financial resources to be present in every, in every negotiation happening all the time and specifically to be able to afford bringing in national experts in different areas, either because they do not, they do not exist or they simply do not have the resources to do so. So that a lot, the, the, the way that the negotiation process was conducted is a, good, is a good example of how we can pull resources to, for different delegations. Also very important was the role of civil society. I myself do not see international subjects, of, uh, international subjects as black and white. I believe there is a specific role uh, for civil society, perhaps not in normative development, but for sure in the case of the VNJ, civil society had a very important role and the way that they intervene in the negotiation process was extremely um, unique in its sense. Um, I will move on. Uh, I will just say that with respect to the EU's engagement in the High Seas Treaty, this is a unique opportunity for the uh, EU to shine. Not only to shine uh, diplomatically, but also to lead the way in some areas that where leadership is required. And I believe that the EU should fully be engaged with the treaty, not only by signing the relevant checks, which need to be signed, but also to lead by uh, example and inspire others. Coming to the specific topic of MPAs, of course, the ecosystem approach is the one, I believe, is the Achilles heels of the overall uh, BBNJ treaty, as it is of international marine environmental law. We do still have not fully engaged with the ecosystem approach, and we need to do so. It is much more than a guiding principle or objective just to be merely enunciated in Article 7 of the treaty. There is, of course, a lack of recognition of the normative nature of the, of, this, uh, of the ecosystem approach. And, of course, we need to fully engage with it in the case of ABMTs, including MPAs. We still prevail, we still give preference to a sectoral and regional approach. And, of course, this has resulted in a piecemeal approach to ocean governance and, of course, with all its negative repercussions. Although reinforcement of international rules is unlikely to, to, to happen, I, I believe this inevitably is the tendency, but it will be slow evolution, we still need to make sure that the existing uh, MPAs are monitored, are fully implemented, not existing paper, and that now with the ones that we will create under the BBNJ Treaty, they will also not be just a mere reference in a website of the Secretariat of the BBNJ. I've written two uh, uh, articles. I'm not selling them. There's, I make no money out of this, believe me. Uh, academics never make money out of, we, of publications. It's a, it's a religion. It's, we are here for the belief. So enhancing uh, marine uh, protected areas and MSP through ecosystem approach. This, I, and I actually believe of all the chapters, they put mine in open access. So you can be sure that you, you can easily have access to it. And uh, a, uh, something that I wrote some time ago, on the role that MSP could have had in the BBNJ Treaty, but actually it didn't. The PowerPoint is available, so it's up to you to, to, if you want to follow up on these things. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you very much.